Ladies and gentlemen, the amazing, the graceful, Mr. Wintley Phipps. Wintley, welcome Hello. to the show. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Welcome to the Become Your Own Superhero podcast. I understand that already right. you're a fan of the show and the work that we're doing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's late in the evening where you are in the world and uh, in Florida. I think you're based. That's yes, the... that's, that's correct. Yes. And look, it's a real thrill. Not many people will have heard the name Willie Phipps before, but I'd love right. to provide an opportunity for you to get to know them and them to get to know you. So welcome to True. the show. It's a, it's a real thrill. Well, I just want you to know that uh, you're in, I almost want to call it my second home. Australia is a place that uh, I have visited many, many, many times. Uh, my youngest son, by the time he was 10, he had been to Australia eight times. Wow. And uh, so I've, I've been from uh, down to, you know, Melbourne and Canberra to Cairns to the Gold Coast to Perth a few times and and so uh I, I i love coming to australia and uh i think you're you're very you're more blessed than you realize living down there oh we know we know well the ones <laughs> that practice enough gratitude realize yeah, sorry. willie what's your favorite memory of your time in australia if you have one you know um I have uh, a lot of different memories. Uh, every time you go to a, a, a part of Australia, uh, you, you, you create a new memory, you know. Um, my memories are significant because I, from the, from the time I was uh, a young boy, I wanted to, a family more than anything else in my life. And so, to do what I do, uh, the only way to keep a family together is you gotta take them with you. And so my family, we have a blessing that few families on the earth, on the earth have. And that is my, my wife and my three sons, all five of us, we have been together on every continent of the world, except Antarctica, of course, you know, we, so we've been to the Great Wall of China together. We've been to Africa together. And so Australia is our family, filled with family memories from, I can't remember the name of the theme park that was uh, not heavily populated and we kind of took it over. And, uh, you know, Dream world, maybe. Uh, yeah, <laughs> to, uh, you know, of course, uh, Going where where Bindi uh, and their and their the, the beautiful park they have there. Uh, one of our precious memories is uh, Hamilton Island, uh, where we went uh, to the Great Barrier Reef together as a family. And uh, so we have a lot of a lot of very special memories. Uh, because I grew up in the Caribbean, I love uh, uh, more tropical kind of climates, and so. I enjoy cans. I love cans, you know, because it, it's it's kind of jungle and and very very tropical. So uh, I, the last time, uh, maybe just a couple of years ago, we were in Perth, and Perth is gorgeous. I mean, it's beautiful what they've done over there. And so, I think my last my first time to Perth was probably uh, twenty years ago, twenty five years ago. Wow. So coming back after all that time, you can imagine. Well, the check from Tourism Australia will be in the mail, I'm sure. <laughs> and because yeah. you were born in Trinidad and yes. you didn't have the best childhood from what right. I can understand. Are you keen to elaborate a little bit for the, for the listeners? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say <laughs> the beautiful thing about being a child is you don't have context yet. So you don't really realize what deprivation or what you're being deprived of. You know, uh, we joke around because you wouldn't know this, but uh, we grew up in a time before television. So, so you, can you imagine growing up on an island 
where there is no television. So you have to learn to occupy yourself and find joy in some of the simplest things, uh, like learning to play marbles, you know, <laughs> or, or and making little toy boats and sailing them down ravines, you know, it, it's, it's, so it's, it's a different thing. But as I got older, I realized that I had come from a very difficult childhood. One of the interesting things about children who come from difficult uh, family experiences or difficult, child, difficult childhood experiences, they develop ways of coping and often those coping mechanisms, as they get older, mature with them and they blossom into compensating gifts. I call them compensating gifts for what they've been through. You know, so, so many comedians, for example, came from really dark homes and dark circumstances and, and that was their way of coping, you know. For me, for me music, was a method of, uh, of coping. Uh, nothing, I, I enjoyed turning, that, turning out the lights and sitting at a piano and, and picking out notes, you know. Um, but I was born to a troubled home and I used to get away from my parents' troubles. I had a little red tricycle. Uh, that was my spaceship. And I would go in the backyard of the house and I would turn the tricycle on its side and use one of the back side wheels as a steering wheel. And I would sit there for hours with my eyes closed and out in the yard and I would dream. And I would dream that I was flying to faraway places in the world. <laughs> hey, get that, right? And, and meeting important people. And uh, when we moved to Montreal, Canada from Trinidad, I was 10 years old. And I remember when I was 12, my father used to take us to the airport the airport, again, you, 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 you're probably not as old as I am, so you, you don't realize back then going to the airport was like a big deal. It was a huge deal, you know, it, because uh, it was the next best thing to getting on a plane was just going to the airport. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my, I, my father would take us to the airport, and before leaving the airport, I'd look around, see if anybody was looking, and I'd grab a handful of the luggage tags and I'd stuff them in my pocket. And I'd go home and get a pencil and print my name, Wentley Phipps, Flight 393 London, Flight 676 Paris. Of course, I didn't think about Flight 929 Sydney, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I, 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 I finally got there, you know? And, uh, and when I was about 14 and a half years old, my voice changed and I've had this voice since I was 15 years old. Uh, wow. And I've had interesting memories uh, because you can imagine a 15-year-old kid sounding like this. Uh, one, one day, I'll tell you this funny story. One day I was uh, hanging around a dance show, kind of like the Canadian equivalent of American Bandstand. And I peeked into the green room and I saw this man in this long sequined sparkling robe and a big hairdo on his head. And I, when I met famous people, I put my voice down a couple of notches, you know, so I said, I, I, read, I said, who is that, Jesus? <laughs> and he leaned back and he said, ooh, where'd you get that voice? <laughs> he said, you just made a drop of sweat fall from under my arm. <laughs> And it was Little Richard. Oh, wow. I, and, I, and I was 15 years old. And Little Richard said, uh, what you doing this evening? I said, I can't think of anything. He said, I can't think of anything. He said, uh, come to my concert. So I went to the Little Richard concert and spent a little time with him backstage. And when they said, ladies and gentlemen, the king of rock and roll, Little Richard, he walked out. And the audience went crazy. He just performed all his big hits. And as a kid, I'm 15 years old, I deduced that probably the, the reason that they were getting so excited was because of these incredible songs he was singing. You, you know, it's like a kid 
we buy Michael Jordan shoes thinking we can dunk like Michael Jordan, or I bought an Arthur Ashe racket thinking I could play like Arthur Ashe at Wimbledon, you know? So I, I thought it was the songs. So at my uh, talent show at school, when they said, Wintley Phipps, I walked out and I did Good Golly Miss Molly and Lucille and, and all Little Richard's hits. The next day, folks were saying, wow, that was great. And all I could say was, thank you very much. <laughs> I tore up my voice trying to sing like Little Richard. I went to the doctor because I had to sing in a few weeks. He said, what did you do? I said, ah. He said, I said, can you give me some medicine? He said, there's no medicine for that. The only thing you can do is just not talk for a week. Oh, or three weeks, actually. So, so I didn't speak for three weeks. And after three weeks, <laughs> the voice was back. And I promised God I would leave Little Richard's songs alone. <laughs> and, uh, and I met when I was 16. You wouldn't know this name probably, but I met a a big pop artist by the name of Sly and the Family Stones. Oh, Sly I know Sly. Don't you worry about you know it. Sly. Yeah. All right. Well, when I met Sly, he was stoned. And, you know, my hero was incoherent. And I said, oh, my goodness. So that's really when I decided, you know what? I'm kind of a solutionist in my thinking. I like to look down the road to see where paths actually take people. Because you can learn a lot by watching where paths take people, the choices they made, the consequences that came from it. And um, of course, I saw that with my own family, you know. And so uh, I made a decision at 16 years old that I was not going to try to be one of the Four Tops or the Temptations or, or Sly Stone or Little Richard. Even though I got to tell you, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you how I learned how to sing. Uh, when I, I didn't have any voice teachers, but I found my voice teacher on the radio. And I would listen to this voice coming over the radio and practice sounding like this voice on the radio. He became my voice teacher on the radio. So for my 34th wedding anniversary, I said to my wife, you know, my voice teacher on the radio that I grew up with, I wonder if he's still singing, if he's still in concert. And I Googled and lo and behold, he was in concert. So I bought plane tickets and concert tickets and something told me, send him a message. So I sent him an email. I said, sir, when I was 15 years old, 16 years old, I didn't have any voice teachers. You became my voice teacher on the radio. You have been my musical inspiration, my musical North Star. And I want to tell you all I've gone on to do with that inspiration. And I told him how I was uh, and blessed to have sung for the last six presidents of the United States, from Jimmy Carter to, I've had breakfast with Ronald Reagan and, and, and Bill Clinton and, and President Obama, and, you know. And, and then I told him, I said, that I, I'm, I, I, I was blessed to be the only soloist at Diana Ross's wedding and, and the last one to sing Amazing Grace for Mother Teresa before she died. Wow. And, and I said, uh, I may not get to see you. I said, but I want to thank you. Hey, brother, I got an email back from him saying, Sir Tom Jones would like to see you and your wife when you come to Las Vegas. <laughs> so, so when I walked into the green room, his eyes went big because I said, it's not unusual to be loved by anyone, you know, <laughs> and, and that's how I learned to sing was listening to Tom Jones on the radio. I could not have picked a better singer to learn from. He still, he's probably almost 80 years old, still sounds awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, 15 years away from 80 and I'm still, I still have this voice. I, you know, I learned, I, I could not have found a better teacher than Tom Jones. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Winley. That's it's, I'm sure you get a chance to, to retell that story many, many times, but that's a real, like, it's an amazing thing. And, and if you haven't had a chance to listen to any of Winley's music, it's, 
it's it's a moment with God is how I describe it. If you close your eyes, it'll transport you to another dimension with you, whatever your religious connotation yeah, or preference. Thank you. Thank you um, but what a thrill for you, meeting oh, Tom yeah. Jones. Oh, and you know, what's crazy is all these years, I've never had a manager. I've never had an agent. I've never had a publicist. I call them hookups from heaven because the phone rings and there's, uh, there's no telling who could be on the other end and what opportunities can have come to me. You know, when, when, when the lady called and said, ah, is this Wintley Phipps? I said, yes. She said, oh, my boss heard you singing. She was standing in front of the television crying. And she said, find this guy. She said, I'm calling you for Diana Ross. And she wants you to be the only soloist at her wedding in Geneva, Switzerland. I mean, Diana Ross could get anybody in the world she wants to sing. Well, anybody from Motown would be happy to come. Stevie asked to sing at the wedding. He sang at the reception. You know? <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Uh, <laughs> you, know, that'd be, you know, but here she reaches for somebody she's never met. She never met me. She reaches for somebody she's never met to be the only soloist at her wedding. And uh, so that's kind of how my opportunities have come. Um, uh, and and there've been so, so many, so many amazing moments. A man called me up one day, he says, sir, uh, I heard you sing this song about giving your life to God. And by the way, I, I wanna tell you that one of my mottos that I live by is that you don't have to compromise to be recognized. To, you, to the best of your ability, be faithful to what you know is right for you and right uh, in the eyes of God. And all, all blessings will come, things will happen. And so he said, I want you, this song, I heard you sing this song about giving your life to God. He said, I'd like to see you sing that song on Soul Train. Now, you probably don't know what Soul Train is. Oh, I do. Soul... Don't you worry about that, will you? You, you, get, you don't get Soul Train. Now. I know Man, what I'm Soul sure. Train. I'm the son of a retired radio announcer. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that stuff. <laughs> Got that soul yeah, train. So, oh. so he, so, yeah, yeah. Soul Train. So he called up Don Cornelius, the host of Soul Train. And he said, I want you to put this young man on Soul Train. And, of course, I only do, since, six, six, since 16 years old, I only do gospel music. I have never done, you know, baby, turn the lights down. You know, that's not what I do, you know. So, and I don't, I believe I don't have to compromise to be recognized. So he said to Don Cornelius, the host of the show, I want you to put this young man on Soul Train. Don Cornelius said, I'm sorry, I can't put anything religious on Soul Train. The man said, well, Don, all you got is young people dressed funny and, you know, dancing and bumping into each other. And what this young man is trying to say in his music those are the very young people who need to hear it. Don Cornelius said, I'm sorry, I can't put anything religious on Soul Train. The man said, listen, Don, my name is George Johnson of Johnson Products Company, Ultra Sheen, Afro Sheen, and my <laughs> company's been back in your show for the last eight years. The next thing I knew, I was the first gospel artist on Soul Train. And, <laughs> and, and Poor Don had to rack his mind to figure out a special show that I could fit in on Soul Train. And so what had happened just, uh, you know, fortuitously and unexpectedly, uh, Minnie Ripperton had just passed away. So he decided to do a tribute to Minnie Ripperton. And I was able to do two gospel songs on Soul Train two songs that I had written on Soul Train. Wow. And, and, the other, and the other musical guest that day was Stevie Wonder. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, 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 that's my life. And I could go on and on and tell you experiences uh, that are, are just wonderful. But I'll tell you what I've learned. Uh, and I'll tell you a, a couple more, if you don't mind. Uh, one of them, I was singing in Baltimore, Maryland. And I came down off the platform and I felt a tap on my shoulder. And a young lady said, excuse me, sir, I just heard you sing. And I 
feel like I can talk to you. She was a little discouraged. And I said, sure. She said, do you have time to talk to me? I said, absolutely. So she, we made arrangements. She came by our home. And we talked and prayed with and encouraged her. And after praying with her, I said, you know, hey, before you go, God has impressed me to tell you. He's going to bless you and give you an opportunity to speak to millions of people. She said, you think God would do that for me? And it was Oprah Winfrey. And that's how we met 39 years ago. And it has wow. been my, my blessing, my blessing, my great honor that she calls me friend and 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 in, I call her, she asked me, what, what would you say your role is in my life? I said, I'm just a spiritual encourager, you know, and that's what I have been in her life all, all these years. Every major accomplishment, she makes sure that I'm there, whether it's building her school in South Africa, uh, her new homes, that she, you know, every, every blessing when, when they inaugurated a special exhibit at the Museum of African American History entitled Oprah. You know, that's how significant her role has been in, in the Black American community and, and in American culture. And, uh, and, and so 9-11, she said, would you write a prayer uh, for prayers every day that I can say on my show all week. So I did that, you know. Um, she just, uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, when it, when it happened, uh, it started, uh, the first person, uh, first single person, she, she uh, interviewed a couple, but, but she called and asked, would you come on and uh, give encouragement to the world uh, on her Apple TV Net, uh, station and so I, I did that so that's just one of the just incredible moments and I love telling them uh, not because I'm dr name dropping or or or, or, t or just sharing uh, um, the names of people that a lot of people know one of my friends was a, a man by the name of Alex Haley who wrote the book Roots from the TV and, show? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, before he died, I sang at his funeral. Before he died, he used to keep a picture in his office of a turtle sitting on a fence. He said that was his way of reminding himself he didn't get there on his own. And I love telling these stories because I know who gets the glory for it. I know that I didn't have a manager that hooked it up. I didn't have a publicist. I didn't have phone numbers for Oprah. You know, I would, I didn't have the ability to see, uh, you know, when, when uh, I, I told her one day, I said, you know, girl, when God impressed me, you'd be speaking to millions of people. I didn't think it was going to be every day. You know, <laughs> I, I, I had no idea how huge and significant, I also learned from that you treat people with respect when you don't know who they are, where they're going, what they can do for you one day, you know, and, uh, and so I love telling these experiences so that people will understand that my life has been a, just a, a, a collection of miracles, miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, you know, to stand in the presence of John Paul II in Rome, in Italy, you know, or, or I'm singing in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, getting ready to go to the dais, and the security people started running back and forth. They said, the governor's coming, the governor's coming, so I straightened out my tie, brushed out my suit, 1990, and they brought in Bill Clinton. I didn't know who Bill Clinton was. Nobody knew who he was. He hadn't even announced he was running for president. So since he was, uh, since they, I was in Hunts, I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and they said the governor's coming, I kind of assumed that he was the governor of Alabama. <laughs> uh, wrong assumption. But when they put him beside me, I went into this long story with him of how much I love Alabama and what a great state Alabama is. And <laughs> he's puzzled, you know, why am I extolling the virtues of Alabama? And when they made the introduction, that's when it dawned on me, oh, no, there's the governor of Arkansas, not Alabama. And uh, when uh, 
he became president, I sang for his first prayer breakfast. And he sent me a note how much he was blessed by the music. And he signed it with thanks, Bill Clinton, governor of Alabama. <laughs> you know, just, just experiences. I'll, I'll tell you one more. I'll tell you one. In 19, it was, I guess it was 1992. 92? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, 1992. My years are running together here. Uh, and it may, be, it may have been 1990. I, uh, I landed in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, February the 8th, 1990, I think it was. Yeah. And the following day, February 9th, I find myself in the offices of President F.W. de Klerk, the president of South Africa, in his office. And pick both of his foreign minister came in. And he, I remember him saying to us, you've come a long way to tell us apartheid is wrong. He said, but I want you to know you're preaching to the choir. He said, we know it's wrong. We need time. We need time to change it. Well, he didn't tell us that the following day he had a secret meeting with Nelson Mandela to inform him that he was suddenly going before the press the following day to announce that in 24 hours he would be released from prison. So as a consequence, Laban, I was in the crowd that welcomed Nelson Mandela when he came out of prison. <laughs> you know, on that historic day where it was, the place erupted in, in its celebration. And uh, so it's, it's, it's been an extraordinary life. But let me tell you the most important lesson I've learned from all of that. I call all those experiences that I described to you moments of destiny. I call them moments of destiny because number one, I couldn't orchestrate it myself. Also because you, your timing has to be absolutely impeccable to, 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 to be at the right place at the right time. You know, uh, so, you know, five minutes later, that moment of destiny would miss you Five minutes earlier, you would have missed it. You know, it, ha it, it all had to come together just at the right moment. Well, uh, God showed me this, probably the most important lesson of my, my life. Moments of destiny, he said to me, are moments for which you were created. But they're not the reason for which you were created. The reason for which you were created is to grow more every day in your character, to resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of God, all the goodness of God, his kindness, his love, his patience, you know, self-control. Lord, give me more of that. And, uh, you know, all, all, all these wonderful dimensions of character. That's the purpose for which we were created. You know, that's, that's my purpose, that's my destiny, because, and that's my highest destiny. Because all these other opportunities that have come, they come to pass. <laughs> you said know they really come to pass you know i i figured out really early a long time ago that when somebody said you know wow you were the first artist on soul train so it's on your resume once already is your goal in life to get that on your resume as many times as possible <laughs> you know can you just kind of check that off uh, 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 you know been there, done that, kind of check it off as 
what is that? What, what's the phrase they use with the Morgan Freeman movie? You know, that's that's uh, what, which what one? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Yeah, they, they, basically, uh, they call it um, essentially something that you look forward to doing all your life, and uh, you were able you were able to check it off. And uh, uh, there's a phrase out. It'll come back to like me. A, but, like the, a bucket list. Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's uh, something like that. It's something exactly like that. Uh, and what's crazy is all all your listeners are going to know exactly the phrase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, bucket list, bucket list, bucket list. That's what it's called. Yeah, you know, you, you, people, you have your bucket list, and that's that. You know, so you so you check those off. You know, what's the excitement about having two checks? You know, another thing that. Uh, if you live for the applause, if you live for the affirmation of the crowds, that's fickle. That'll go away. You know, Tom Jones was hotter than sliced bread when I was growing up. You ask young people today about Tom Jones, they look at each other in glassy eyes and say, who is Tom Jones? You know, so all of that comes to pass. Uh, and the only thing that is really eternal and that's forever is what you have become. And, and, and that's work. And that's a lifetime uh, of work to, 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 to keep as your goal your best self to want to become the best spiritual version of who you feel called to be. If you kind of keep that as your North Star, everything else falls into place. And actually, when you keep that as your prime motive in life, it puts all the other things in there proper perspective. You know, I have received more applause uh, than one man deserves in a lifetime. You know, I I've been on an airplane once or twice a week for 30, 40 years going somewhere in the world. Uh, I have millions and millions of miles uh, from traveling all around the world. You know, I I I've been on, on four or five continents and 24 hours, you know, 48 hours. Uh, I, I, you know, one, one time we, my family, with, with my family, we circumnavigated the globe. We started out in Washington, D.C., flew to Los Angeles, flew to Sydney, flew on to Singapore, flew on to London, flew on to L.A. from London. So we literally went in the same direction all around the globe. And so when you've done those things, you you ha you have to put them in perspective. They have their place, but they, not for one moment, do they touch the beauty of growing to be a person of kindness and to be a person of love. Uh, and, and it's a lot of learning. It's it's a life of learning, and, and that's and you got to love learning. You, you got to love learning about yourself and how to be your best, best self. My, my definitions of love, for example, my first definition of love is that love is when you choose to be at your best when the other person is not at their best. Now, that's a lifelong, that's lifelong learning right there. You know, it'll take a, life, a lifetime to really learn that well to choose because it's a choice. You have to choose to be at your best when the other person is not at their best. Uh, my second definition of love is love is when what you want is never important. And what the other person needs and wants is always paramount and always to you more important. That's a tough one, uh, but that's 
So learning those lessons, that's, that's what life is all about, growing into that, uh, mastering that more and more every day. That's, that's what life is all about to me. Whitney, I read about this in your book and there was a, a, an area that you referenced with a father and a daughter and the car was heading towards them and it was careening out of control and he was left with no option but to hold his daughter above his head and sacrifice his own life and the daughter survived. Yeah. Is that the kind of love you're talking about? That's yeah, kind of love I'm talking about. And, and l- let me tell you, when you said that, an experience, I was reminded of an experience that I'll, I'll share with you. I had an aunt come by to visit me who I hadn't seen in years. And she was walking around my house, looking at all of the pictures, you know, with all the presidents. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a weird thing to kind of watch somebody you know and you see them <laughs> with all these different people. And she watched some of the videos of my performances and she said, you know, I want to tell you something. And so she sat me down and she said, uh, your father, my brother, we had a sister named Pearl. And two years before you were born, Pearl died while having an abortion. The family was broken hearted and devastated over this. She was beautiful. She had a beautiful singing voice. And then she said, and when your mother became pregnant with you out of wedlock, there were many who were urging her to have an abortion. But the sisters of your father, we remembered what we went through. And so we rallied around her and we said, no, this is not, we're not going through this kind of pain again. She said, uh, your mother's mother paid a visit to your father's mother, to our mother, and they closed the door and they talked about this situation and they made a pact. The pact they made was that they would pray a prayer. Lord, make this child's life a blessing to the world. She said, often I would see my mother with a candle over your bassinet praying, Lord, make this child's life a blessing to the world. And I I share that because I personally believe I'm also the answer to two grandmothers' prayers. I believe this unusual instrument God gave me, and it is unusual because, you know, the music industry has emasculated the male bass baritone solo singing voice. There aren't any men like a Tom Jones or like an Engelbert Humperdinck. There are men who stand up and sing solos today, you know, and with low voices. Uh, And, uh, but yet I have this instrument and, And so often when I get up to sing, people are in shock for a minute because many times they're listening to a sound coming up out of the voice, out of the body, I should say, of a human being that many of them have never heard live. You know, some of us old enough, old enough to remember, you will never find, you know, Lou Rawls singing low, Barry White, or, you know, even Paul Robeson, if you're old enough to remember that. Louis Armstrong, maybe? Yeah. I'll <laughs> see you, so, yeah, that, That's right, that's right, that's right. But we don't, there are no bass baritone hip hop singers, for example. You know, no one is still singing in that register. So it, it has given me a uniqueness in, in the world as a result, you know. Uh, and, and in the world, it's interesting. Don't ever forget this, my friend, that in the world, you're not known by your similarities with others but by your, unique, your uniqueness, your difference. It's what sets you apart, what I call your badge of distinctive competence, what it is that you do that's you that nobody else can duplicate. And, uh, and so I've got this instrument, but I believe 
It is the answer to two grandmothers' prayers. But what really touched my heart was it dawned on me, and your telling the story is what uh, made me think of this. What really touched my heart was I realized that because my aunt Pearl died, I was able to live. Because she died, I was able to live. And uh, so it's, you know, that's, that, that touched me. And, it, and when you shared that experience, that's what came to my mind. Wendley, there's one other thing that, one other story that just springs to mind when you, when you're saying that, and it was further to that relationship that you had with Bill Clinton. Yeah. when he was going through all the Lewinsky scandal. That's right. Are you happy That's to right. share that one with us? Absolutely, sure. Well, you know, when I met Bill Clinton and uh, a faux pas, a mistake, seared a memory in his brain, <laughs> you know? So he would talk, whenever, when I would be in his presence, he would love to tell that story of, you know, here I was, didn't know who he was, thinking he was the governor of Alabama, you know, and, and or if we were at different functions at the White House when I would sing, you know, or or even just in the audience, if I'm in the audience, and he'd look up and he's from his speech, and oh, hey, Winkley. And of course, the whole place is, who is that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> the president is calling out his name like that, you know, like he knows him, you know, on a first name basis. So I was, I, I, I got to know him and he got to know who I was. And so when the Monica Lewinsky story broke, I watched him aging in front of our eyes and I just felt impressed of God to send him a message. And I, I said, uh, Mr. President, God has asked me to ask you to please read Psalm 69. In the book of the Psalms in six, Psalm 69, David says, Save me, O God, for the waters are coming unto my soul. I'm sinking in deep mire where there's no place to stand. The floods overflow me. I'm weary of my crying. My throat is parched. I knew he would identify where David said, those that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. I knew he'd identify where David said, God, you know my foolishness. And my sins are not hidden from you. And then David said, God, let not those who seek after you be ashamed because of me. So I'm at another function at the White House. And his labor secretary pulled me to the side and said, you don't know what happened. I said, no, what happened? She said, uh, in, the, in the midst of this crisis, uh, uh, the president called a few of us together, his closest cabinet members. Uh, and we were angry at him. We were going at him because of his conduct. He began to read to us from Psalm 69. How it troubled him. And he went up to his room and wrote out the first speech that he ever gave to the American people. When he finally came clean and said, you know, I, I'll never forget the speech. He said, there's no fancy way for me to tell you, but I did sin. And I am a sinner. You know, and he sent me a handwritten note after how much he was, you, know, you received, said, Dear Wendley, he said, I received your message about Psalm 69. I, I read it with care and gratitude. I appreciate your wise counsel, your prayers. I need them all right now. And, and as a result, when I started uh, the work I do in America, I, 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 I do, uh, I started a, a charity called the U.S. Dream Academy, and we provide tutoring and mentoring to children in America whose parents are incarcerated. Wow. Because we found that 60 to 70 percent of all the kids who end up going to prison come from the children of those who are in prison. And I wanted to do what I could to break that cycle of intergenerational incarceration. And, um, yes, and, and so when I started that, um, 
I w one of the reasons I was able to get it going is because he invited me to the Oval Office to make a presentation to him about this charity I was building. And so here I am, you know, sitting in the Oval Office with the President of the United States, making a, a presentation to him to build this organization. And he helped me to start it. And when I finally got it going, my first center, I now have centers in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, Houston, Salt Lake City, San Bernardino, California, Orlando. But when I first started it, my first one was in Washington, D.C., the President of the United States came, President Clinton, to speak at my opening of my first center. You know, that's like you opening up a, a, a charity and, you know, the Prime Minister of Australia comes to and speaks, you know, it, it's, it's a big, it was a big deal. It's and a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. And so, it, you know, that's, it, that was a blessing that came out of a mistake, me thinking that he's the president, he's the governor of Alabama. <laughs> you basically got Bill to spill the beans and alleviate all that stress and worry off his shoulders and allowed him to go on and, and probably allowed the rest of the country, if not the rest of the world that were watching that to go, oh, you know what? He's just a human being. Right. Good on you, Bill. Right. Yeah. And, and that really changed everything, the tra trajectory of, his, of his, his political career. And I'm sure I wasn't the only one that God used to help nudge him to that moment. But obviously, he acknowledged that I was one of those that uh, helped to move him to that place. And, and he invited me to come to hear him give that speech. So, so you can imagine what that must have been like having sent him that note, having him make that decision that he was gonna come clean and then say, when I, when, I make that when I make that speech, when I come clean, I want you there. And, and uh, so I'm in the East Room of the White House to hear him give this speech. And I'm in a daze really because, I'm in a daze because it hits me that I am sitting in the White House, the friend of a president, helping him through a difficult time. And I connected it with the little boy on the tricycle. You know, seeing himself going all over the world, meeting important people, you know. Uh, and there are some heroes that I never got to, to meet I would have loved to have met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I traveled for 25 years with Billy Graham, so it was my, my blessing to know him. Uh, one day I was singing in Washington, Amazing Grace, and to my left was Yasser Arafat. Wow. <laughs> to, my, to my right is Mrs. Rabin, <laughs> you know, you know and, and I'm saying, God's grace, you know, singing about God's grace. Um, so I've, I've met some wonderful people, and but there's some that I, I, I didn't get to meet. I would have loved to meet Luther Vandross, because I think he was one of the greatest singers uh, of, of my lifetime. Um, but dreaming, you know, you, 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 you are part of a, a British Commonwealth country, so you know there is a special uh, mystery that you carry in your heart for England as a result. You know, you, you grew up one day hoping that you might get a chance to go to London. Uh, and that's what it was in Trinidad. Trinidad was a British Commonwealth country. And, and, and so when we read stories about England and London and, and when we saw the double-decker buses on pictures or or when we saw red those red mailboxes those round red mailboxes you know you say well you know they, they held a special appeal uh and um but there was one one person in england that held great appeal to my imagination because 
he, he was a hero to me. And that was Sir Winston Churchill. And uh, it was May 8, 1995, the 50th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. I found myself about 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning, standing over the grave of Sir Winston Churchill. 50 years after World War II on that day. And there were floral tributes that had been left by freedom fighters from Greece and France and Norway who had gone there before I did in the morning, early in the morning, and to pay their respects to this man 50 years later. Now, that is amazing to me, to, to make such an impact on the world that 50 years later, people cannot forget you and make pilgrimages to your grave. And there was a, a tribute uh, by an American who had been there before I was. It was a written, handwritten tribute on a single sheet of paper. And it, uh, he was on it, on it, he was thanking Sir Winston Churchill from what he meant to the world during this critical hour of Earth's history. And he ended his tribute with the words of John F. Kennedy about Sir Winston Churchill, who once said of Churchill, and Laban, this is, I'm gonna pray this for you. I'm gonna pray this blessing for you, my friend. John F. Kennedy said of Churchill, he commissioned the English language and sent it off to war. Oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> he commissioned the English language as a, as a, a, a wonderful speaker as you are. Well, thanks. That's, that's, that's an amazing way to see what you do. You, you are warring against discouragement. You commission the English language. You're warring against hopelessness. You're, you're warring against depression. You're, you're warring against people who have lost their sense of self-worth and self-esteem. You're warring against that, those, that negativity. And uh, so you keep doing that, my friend. You keep commissioning the English language and send it off to war. Well, with that kind of blessing, Wintley, how can I not? And thank Very you good. for the, the vote of encouragement. And you'll be absolutely delighted to know that through marriage on my grandmother's side, on my mum's side, I am related to Winston Churchill. So oh, maybe, right? yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. I'm originally That's from New Zealand. I've been living in Australia for 20 years. I'm, I'm half and half. Dad's the Australian. Yes. And yeah. I was very pleased to hear that that is, is pretty certain. So Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. Well, yeah, and, and he, was, uh, an ama he was an amazing human being. And uh, like everyone else, else had his faults, but boy, what a role he played. Uh, I, I, the, and, and some of his speeches are just iconic and should always be remembered. And one of them, and by the way, you know, you, I don't know if you know, but he he struggled with depression for most of his life. He actually had a term for it. He called it the black dog. And when it came over him, he, 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 would, he would be very, very, but many believe it was that depression that gave him this irrational optimism. It, it was like, you know, we will fight on the beaches. I mean, you don't have anybody to fight with. You, know, you, you, you don't have enough tanks. You don't have enough planes, you know. But it, it was like this irrational optimism. We're going to fight. And, and one of my favorite phrases of his, I'll give you two phrases of his. Uh, one is that uh, if England, and I'm paraphrasing, if England is lost to the Nazis, strung around this globe will be remnants of the British Navy and they will fight on. 
<laughs> just, it's just kind of irrational optimism. And, uh, and one of my wonderful thoughts, he, he said that, uh, and, and, and I apply it to the family, a loving mother, caring father, in a healthy relationship, raising children. He said, no superior alternative has been found. You know, we can do it a lot of other ways, but no superior alternative has been found. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Doing the best he can with the tools he has to his knowledge. That's correct. That's correct. And I and I, I was blessed to visit his birthplace too, Blenheim Palace. Uh, that that was that was an experience. Did you go down to the underground bunker when you're in London? No, I didn't get to do that. I haven't gotten to do that. If yet. you get a chance, I, I, it brought me to tears thinking about it. Really? It's because it's all been kept the same. Um, yes. And you walk through it. It's extraordinary. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know. It, and and uh, I've done, I've watched more World War II documentaries than any human being alive, probably. <laughs> uh, because... Speaking to me, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one of the reasons is, I've always tried to understand how it is that this very religious country, which Germany was very religious at the time, how they were or could uh, sink so low and kill so many human beings. Um, and I saw that there are four, uh, I want to say, or weapons that evil uses to capture the minds of even, of even decent people. Four weapons. The first is power. No matter who they are, whether they're church people, whether they're non-church people, power does something to corrupt the human mind that is very profound. The other is pride. You know, pride of race. You know, you think you're better than somebody else because you have a different color. Uh, one of my teachers told me something I'll never forget. He said, you know, better off doesn't mean better than. <laughs> you know, uh, we're struggling in America right now with this issue of uh, what it's like to be a person of color living every day with a target on your back. Because you do, you, you do feel that, and it's stressful. You do feel stress, great amount of stress. Uh, and uh, so you have power, you have pride. In other words, pride of race and racial superiority is what makes a person feel they can hurt another person who they may have may feel is already damned in their own mind you know uh, so power pride third one is presumption presumption means i know what's right but i'm going to suspend doing what's right and it's going to be okay. God will understand. I'm going to still do well. So when you suspend knowing, doing what you know is right, thinking that it'll all, it'll be good anyway, it's going to work out anyway. You know, it's like, you know, I'm going to be unfaithful to my spouse, but, uh, I'm, I got a good reason, <laughs> you know, uh, that's presumption, that's presumption. And then the last one, that, that's a killer, uh, is pleasure. You know, pleasure meaning my lifestyle, pleasure meaning the quality of life that I've grown to be, <laughs> to be accustomed to, uh, that often suspends our judgment. And, and, and so I, I've done a lot of study trying to figure out 
And what I've come to, essentially what I've come to, to understand is that there is nothing in the world more important than your character. There's nothing in the world more important than the character of people. You know, in business, we hire for skills, but fire for character. Uh, you know, character is key to a good marriage, to a good business. Um, you know, you, you really want somebody alongside of you for the ride who is kind and who is patient and who is loving and who is, you know, is humble enough to know they, know they don't know everything. And they were still willing to learn. I got someone like that. Yeah, I, I do too. I've, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been blessed um, this year. I've been married 44 years this year. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. And I, I tell her if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> and, uh, but, and, and I'll tell you something as you get older. I don't know how long you've been married. How long have you been married? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not married yet. Not yet. We're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. All we're right. Okay. right now. All right. Well, when, when you do, I will tell you this. Um, there's something that happens as you get older and you recognize the, the, it, it's something, a switch gets flipped and you recognize, oh, wait a minute. If something ever goes wrong physically with this person, with my spouse, I want to be the one there to take care of her as long as he lives, period. When, when you've reached that place, it's a wonderful, and because, uh, you know, you change physically, you know, lots of things change. As a matter of fact, I, I kind of tell people it's one of the reasons I think God lets our eyes grow dim as we get older so we still look good to each other. You know? <laughs> we, we keep squinting, squinting and say, oh, you look so good. You know, and the eyes are kind of fuzzy. Damn, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can barely see, right? Uh, but but uh, that's, that's, again, character. And and uh, and it's and, it, and it's an example of of the kind of character that is really what life is all about. Life is all about can you build and can you build can you be a person of integrity? Can you be a person of virtue, of moral goodness? You know, can you be a person who loves to learn? Can you be a person who keeps, you know, all our lives till the day we die, we're going to be working on that self-control. You know? Learning and understanding that if you can't walk away from it, you don't own it, it owns you. And, and you, you are being shackled by something that you don't want to be a slave to. And, and, and making sure that you, you live in victory over that or, or whatever it is. You know, so characters, that's what I've come to understand. It's really poignant, Wentley, and you touched on it at the very start of the, the conversation with regards to the, the coping mechanisms. And for me personally, having gone through this journey of understanding what I went through in, in, as a child of divorce and witnessing dysfunction, as I understood that those things were gifts to me later on in my life, I was able to take ownership and, and I lost the desire for that behavior, that behavior of wanting to cheat or overeat yeah. or drink or do right. drugs or gamble. It's just yeah. largely disappeared to the point yeah. where I've almost beaten sugar, like the, the <laughs> final frontier. Black coffee is my only vice, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I can walk away from it if, if I want to, if I feel like it's not serving me well. That's a really powerful thing. And, yeah. You've touched on that many times throughout this conversation. But for anyone that's sitting, listening to this or watching this, and they just want one piece of advice from Winley, where do I start? Right. Well, I think if, if I would give you eight principles, 
and I've gone over them, but focus on them. You know, just, just eight. And the eight are, number one, learn to be a person of strong belief. You know, when you, are, when you believe strongly, you are in, an inspiration to others. Because you have, when you believe strongly, you have conviction. To believe strongly, you have to be childlike. You have to be a visionary. You have to em embrace uh, things that are not yet real. But, you, but to be, learn to be a person of strong belief. I can't tell you what's going to be tomorrow, but I know it's going to be great. You know, that kind of that kind of attitude. Be a person of virtue, of morality, of moral goodness. This is where you start. Third, be a person who loves to learn. You know, whoever's listening to this, they're learning. You're 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 a teacher, you know. People are learning from I'm learning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so love to learn. Fourth one is self-control. Work at that. Make that one of your goals. Start with something that you know keeps, you know, bringing you down and causing trouble in your life and difficulty uh, or sickness or whatever. De deal with it. Uh, the fifth one is patience or some people call perseverance. Just hang in there, you know, recognizing that impatience destroys more talented people than anything else you can think of. You know, the people who, who are patient, they're the ones who often see the, the blessings that were on their way. You know, it, it takes it takes patience. The other is learn to have a respect for what is sacred. You know, whether it's the dignity of a human being. That's one of the things in America we're struggling with right now. You know, there, you know, there are many religious people who feel that the life of an unborn baby is sacred, as I do but they don't see the life of a grown man whose life is being snuffed out as being just as sacred. So they will, they will march for one view of sanctity of life, but will be silent on the other, you know? And, uh, but be consistent, understanding that you have a respect for what is sacred what it is, whether it's uh, your marriage or your relationship, see the sacred, you, you know, the dignity of a, of a child, never abuse a child, never ab uh, abuse a child's, dr uh, dash a child's dream. See that as sacred, you know, the dream a little kid is carrying in their heart, you know, so respect. Respect for what is sacred. And the last two are kindness and love. I gave you my definitions of love. One of my best or favorite illustrations about kindness comes from a story, and I suppose this is a true story, of when Captain, uh, the, 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 one of the uh, British, one of the American captains, I should say, took Pocahontas uh, to London to kind of show off this Native American beauty queen, essentially. And, uh, and while there, he asked her to marry him. And uh, she asked for some time to think about it. And so after a little while, she came back to him and she she gave him her answer. She said, I only have one question for you. She said, are you kind? Are you kind? 
if you have a spouse, whether it's your husband, your wife, uh, who is kind, you've got a treasure. You've got a treasure. So, I so, mean, so where where does that where to start? Start with those eight dimensions of character to build them. Wow. Thank you very much for that. That's a really amazing, concise, genius way. And I'm going to watch this uh, back. And I'm, going to, I'm going to take a few notes. I'm going to tell you. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> Winley, I'm very, very respectful of your incredibly busy schedule and was pleased yeah. to see that the only other podcast you've done recently was the one with Oprah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're in, you know, we're in good company here. I yeah. wondered whether... If, if you'd be happy to finish this up with sure. maybe a few notes of your favorite song. Oh, absolutely. I'll be glad to do that. And uh, I've sung this song for prisoners and presidents. Uh, and uh, it is really a signature song for me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And that's what we do with our lives. We try to open the eyes of people to see a new way and a new life and embrace it and live the, the life that they were born to live. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wintley Phipps. Mm -hmm.